of families today. Matter of fact, statistics says it is. The number one destroyer. And it's an enemy that preys on addictions. It, it, it wants us to be addicted because the more we're addicted, the more that enemy can work and the more it can destroy our families and, and, and the more it has to be a part of our lives. Matter of fact, in last year in 2023, 63% of Americans admitted that they were suffering from this addiction that's destroying our families. But before I tell you what the addiction is, I want to remind you what the definition of an addict is. An addict is this. A person who is controlled by a substance, specific thing, or activity while believing that they are in control of the situation. Now you think of anything that you know that, that, folks, that are addictions that folks face. That fills the description. It, it's anything that, that is controlling us that we think we're in control of. I mean, how many times have you saw that alcoholic say, you know, I can stop anytime I want to. Or you see that drug addict say, it's not affecting me. I, I can do whatever I want. So an addiction is that thing that a person that's controlled, an addict is a person that's controlled by a substance, specific thing or activity, while believing that they're in control of the situation. Now you know what the addiction is that I'm talking about that's destroying our homes? It has a name. They've actually given it a, a title. It's called Internet Addiction Disorder. Americans are addicted to screen time. We are. And, and the thing is, we've welcomed it. And we, we strive to, to get hooked on it early. As parents, how, we, we try to get our children addict, addicted to screen time. And I can tell you, that has changed over the years. But I'm guilty. You, you know what my, the, I tried to get my kids addicted to? Videos. I called it a babysitter in a box. I actually had VCR tapes, but I couldn't find any of those anymore. But, but I, I called it a babysitter in a box because I could put that thing in and I knew exactly where my children would be for the next hour and 45 minutes. Right there in front of the TV. And, and, and I loved it because I could get things done. I could work on whatever I needed to work on. And, and, and my kids were right there. And, and then when that movie was over, they'd either watch the same movie again or they'd do it. And, and, and I started about young, getting them addicted to screen time. Now we, we, it, it looks a little different. We may not put them in front of a, a video, but we hand them our phones. Here, this will keep them quiet for a little while. Here, they're restless. Go ahead and, and just play a game or, or do whatever. So what we're doing is we're striving to get our kids addicted to the number one enemy of our homes. And it's an enemy that plays on our addictions. So folks, if we're going to fight for our families, it's necessary for us to talk about the things that control our families. And right now, for many households, we're serving the God of technology. Now hear what I said. We're serving the God of technology. You know what God says about serving other gods? That's why I chose the passage in Exodus. That, that's the first of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20 verse 1 says this. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Never have any other God. Never make your own carved idols or statues that represent any creature in the sky, on the earth, or in the water. Never worship them or serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a God who does not tolerate rivals. I punish children for their parents' sins to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. God tells us here that, that when we are serving something else, it not only affects us, it affects our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. And that continues down the line. And God says, thou shalt not have any other God before me. So I want us today to begin by looking at some of the dangers of technology to our families. 
Now, as we begin, I want to tell you, this is not Pastor Dan's stuff. I pulled each of these dangers from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And according, now this is what I say, the National Institute of Drug Abuse put out a list talking about the dangers of technology to our families. What does that tell us about the addiction? So this comes from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. What happens when we have too much technology in our families? Number one, we have trouble sleeping. Screen time affects our sleep. Now, some of the things from science that we know, we know the body releases a chemical called melatonin. And, and melatonin is re released in response to darkness. Now, some of you all know about melatonin because you buy it in a gummy at the, at the Walmart or somewhere and you take one or two or three or six or whatever you think you need to take to help you sleep at night. Well, your body actually produces melatonin, but it does it in the darkness. But what they say is happening is our screens mess with that idea of our mind with darkness so it's not producing the amount of melatonin that it should. The brightness from our screen causes the body no longer to re release that chemical. Now here's the thing I hear folks say all the time. Well, I have to have the TV on to sleep. When actually the TV is the thing that's causing you not to sleep. But, but, you know, we, we, here's what we say. I have to have it, you know, because why? We're addicted. We already know what happens when we don't get a good night's sleep. Our immune system becomes weakened. We get sick. You know, we're not able to function. We're not able to do the things we do. And I know half of you right now are going, well, I can still do everything I need to do. And that's okay because I know half of you have already just turned this message off. Because you're thinking, it's not me. I'm in control, just like an addict. But here's what happens. It causes us to not sleep. The second thing they say that happens when there's too much screen time is it causes mood changes. Scrolling and texting affect emotional behavior. They've already proven that. Studies link higher levels of screen time to symptoms of depression. Do you imagine that when we're mindlessly scrolling through Facebook or some other social, it actually causes depression in our lives. It causes us to neglect responsibilities. It adds stress to our life. So what does it do? It, it, it changes our moods. The third thing they say that happens when we have too much screen time is it alters our, alters our brain. It's altering our brain as we're... Now, now, there's nothing wrong with screen time. But when we have too much of it, when we're spending more of our time on, on our screens, on our phones, in front of the TV, in front of our tablets, in front of the computer, what it's doing is altering our brain. The cortex is the outer uh, layer of the brain that processes information. Now, now, for me to be able to tell you that, you know this didn't come from me. So it's still coming from the same place, the National Institute for Drug Abuse. Uh, so the cortex is the outer layer of the brain that processes information. During adolescence or, or, or during childhood, that's when the cortex undergoes critical development. The cortex is actually, actually thickening through, through adolescent years. Uh, and then as we get older, the, then that cortex begins to thin. And, and we don't know why it's doing it, but that's one of the reasons why we can't remember the things we used to remember. Because as the cortex thins out, it, it, it takes that ability to process information and doesn't work, use it as well. A study called the ABCD, which is the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development, revealed that kids who use screens more than three hours a day have a thinner cortex than those who use less screens. By the time they're teenagers, those who have excessive screen time, they have found that the cortex of their brain has already thinned to the place of 60 to 70 year old adults. And they're linking the cause to too much screen time. It alters our brains. Number four, 
Too much screen time causes decreased learning. Now this one gets a little tricky. Because what we know as, as parents, there's all these nice little programs that we can get for our children that helps to de- help them to develop quicker and helps them to learn faster and, and does all these things. And, and it helps them develop all these learning skills. And many times as parents, we've used those things to help our children and help them to learn. And there's so many programs out there that, with this design in mind. I remember once a parent telling me that they were going to make sure that their children were above the median curve in introducing technology to uh, to, to them at a very young age. They wanted to make sure that their kids were up on all the modern technology, and and so they they were going to start them really young. Now, the truth is, and this is why I say it gets tricky, the truth is these programs that help kids in learning do, in fact, aid our children in learning. Studies have shown that through those preschool years and those early elementary years, those kids that, that their parents have, have given them all the little learning projects to you know, help them with their, their development and help them to learn more things, through the preschool years and the early elementary years, it actually does put them ahead of the class. But by the time they're around 8 to 10 years old, that advanced learning begins to change. And now what they've shown is that those who haven't spent as much screen time with all the little learning programs, by the time they're 8 to 10, those children actually have learned better and faster and and now have a higher learning curve than those who have spent all the time in the screen. Somewhere around that 8 to 10 year old, it not only levels out, but those other children surpass in learning the kids that have spent so much time in their screen. So what do we find? The dangers of too much screen time causes decreased learning. Now the last one, it's one we all know. We see it. Too much screen time causes social inadequacies. It takes us the social things and, and, and we're not able to do them as much. The ability to communicate with others is often one of those first noticeable symptoms of those who suffer from internet addiction disorder. We're not able to communicate as as folks once did. There becomes a breakdown in our communication. As families spend more time with their electronic devices, there's less time to communicate with each other. Now, it's easy for us to say, you know, well, my kids do, but but often it's us. It's we adults who are the ones that are on our phones or on our tablets or in front of the TV or in front of the Xbox, and, and, and we're not teaching our children to communicate. Parents find sometimes it's easier just to text their kids than to communicate with them. I've seen families do this. Set at the kitchen table or the dining room table or a restaurant table across texting each other. Because that's what we've developed into. We can't communicate. And I can tell you, because we've gone so far, what's going to happen if all of a sudden we say, let's take away all of our phones while we eat. Our kids are going to struggle. Well, I'm bored. There's nothing to do. Are we, are we done eating? Can we have our phones back? I, I guarantee it. Because we've lost the ability to communicate. There, there's a breakdown. But something else that disturbs me probably as much is there's a breakdown in friendships. One of the things that, that, that they've noticed that happens with those who spend so much time you know, on the Internet, and, and we have followers, not friends. We have all these folks who follow us. And here's the secret. Those who follow us are doing it for the same reason we're following them. The only reason, and really it boils down to there's two reasons why we're on social media. One, we want to promote ourselves. And number two, we want to see what others are doing so we can promote ourselves better. I mean, that's, that's just the whole bottom line of it. So as we, we're on, we, we, you know, we, we, want, we want everybody to know what we did. My kid got 43rd place at a track meet. There was only 42 people there, but I'm so proud. You know, they were sick that day, so they didn't even go. Here's their picture. Now, I'm kind of being funny because, you know, yeah, we do that. Never mind. We want to promote ourselves. Or we want to see what others are doing so we can know what we need to do better. 
They went on seven vacations last year, honey. We got to do eight this year. So we're trying to do better. But what we've done is we've developed followers, not friends. Here's the test. You may have a gazillion followers on social media, but who shows up when you're sick? Who's there when you have a need? Often there's nobody. You probably all, because we're on social media, you've seen the meme on Facebook. It's a funeral setting and the casket's there and one person's here and it says, I don't understand, he had 600 followers on social media and nobody showed up to the funeral. What it's done is it's hurt our ability to make friends. And, and we don't have those friendships that we used to have. Now, friends, I, I want you to know something. We could sit here and argue all day long about whether screen time affects us or whether it affects our children. But truthfully, the numbers don't lie. Too much screen time hurts our family. If we're going to fight for our families, then I think we have to make a change. And so what I want to do is I want to give you some ideas to make that change. And to do that, here's where we have to start. We have to realize that what we have become is a slave to technology. So to make the change, we need to make technology our slave, not our master. So as we, we, we begin to look, we, we have to make technology our slave, not our master. So I, I'm going to give you some, some things to help to do that. Number one, give undivided attention. You, you want to make technology your slave and not your master? Start by get, That's what Jesus did. You, you notice that throughout Scripture, Jesus gave one-on-one -on -one attention to whoever he was talking to. It didn't matter if it was the woman with the issue of the blood or, or the leper or the blind person. Jesus focused on them. He gave them his full attention. When we're talking to somebody, especially if it's our child or our spouse, put the phone away and give them full attention. Make sure that one of the things that we're doing is whoever we're having a conversation with, we give them full attention. I have a secret. The secret is not a one of us is as important as we think we are. I mean, honestly, not a one of us. And here's why I say that. Because we think we're so important that when all of a sudden we feel that buzz or we see that light flash, or we hear that ding, we think we got to see what it is because somebody's telling us something important. Oh, we're going to save a bundle on our car insurance. Oh, wow. But here's the thing. We're not as important as we think. So whoever we're talking to, let's start by giving them full attention. Now, yeah, that may mean that sometimes you have to turn the TV off to have a conversation. I know I'm really stretching it there. But here's what's become the norm. We become the norm that we turn away from those that we love in order to answer a text or take care of someone else's needs. So you know what we're teaching our spouse? You know what we're teaching our kids? We're teaching them that they're not as important to us as somebody else that sent us a message. So here's what we're saying. Number one, in order to make technology our slave and not our master, we need to do like Jesus did. Give full attention. Make a commitment to those in front of you that they are your top priority during this conversation. And, and you're not going to accept interruptions from your phone or from your device. Look them in the eye, to eye and listen to them as Jesus did. Give attention. Undivided attention. Number two, do not default to texting. When sharing heartfelt feelings when we're sharing important thoughts with others, get as close to in-person as you can with that person. If it's not possible to be face-to-face -face with them, then before sending a text, 
Try a video chat. And if that don't work, try a phone call. So, so, that, so that you can have that conversation with each other rather than just sending the text. An idea I came across, and I actually do this but for a different reason, is develop a three-text rule. If you cannot complete the conversation within three texts, make a phone call. Now, I've done that for years, but my reason is I'm a very slow texter. And so, so I, I, it's just easier, hey, this is going to be a conversation, I'm calling you. And, and some of you, I've already figured out, I send you a text and say, I'm calling you. That way you answer the phone. But, but here's the thing. For me, it's just because I'm slow, but what if we just did that? You know, what, what, what if we're, we're taking that, make that phone call? Do a video chat. In person if we can, to have that important conversation. Do not default to texting. Number three. Delay giving children smartphones and social media accounts. D -d Delay. D they don't have to have that at age two. They, they really don't. They don't have to have that at age five. The Delay in giving them. And here's why they say that. We need to allow our children time to develop adequate in-person social skills. You know, things like listening, things like making eye contact, things like showing empathy, things like being aware of those around them. Our children need to develop those in-person skills before they enter the digital world that takes those away. Because if they start out with this, they're never going to develop those in-person skills. We're seeing it today in our classrooms. Our, our, our children can't communicate. They, they can't focus. They can't. And a large part of it is because of the screen time. So as, as we do that, you know, help them. Did y'all realize that right now in America, the average age of exposure to pornography is eight years old? Eight years old. Why? Because it's there. Oh, Pastor Dan, I monitor my kids. They're only on certain. It's there. And, and, and adults, I'm going to give you a little secret, one adult to the other. Your kids know more ways around technology than you do. I'm telling you. You may think you have it in control, but they've already found the loop. Why do they need it, Zenon? Remember, you say, well, my child is mature. My child can handle social media. My hand, they can handle the things I give. Maybe they can. Maybe your child's very mature and they can handle that. But you know what? Some of those folks who are going to have access to them on social media can't. So your child might be mature enough to handle, but some of those that are on their followers aren't and they're introducing all kinds of stuff to our kids so what do we do delay in giving our children smartphones and social media accounts number four establish family rules and limits I think one of the things that we have to do as parents is we have to establish rules in our family. You say, we don't even have kids. I think you still need to establish rules and limits to your family. Create clear boundaries for the use of your phone or your tablet or the TV in your house. Create some guidelines for that. I think a good guideline may be screen time usage for the family should only happen in common areas. Don't take our phones, our tablets, our, our smart devices or whatever and, and go off into another room where nobody can see what you're doing. Do that in common areas. Often we say, well, well my child, they, they need access, they need their privacy. They, 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 they need time with their friends. I had one parent that stood in front of me and got really mad when I told him that my children did not have a TV in their room. And they couldn't understand that.
because it was important for their child to be able to watch what they want to watch and, and, and as an adult they could watch what they wanted to watch. I think we need to establish those limits. I, one of the families I read about uh, decided that devices, this was their rule for their house, devices need to be plugged in and set aside during and after the evening meal so that family members could focus on spending uninterrupted time together. So from supper time on, devices were plugged in and left alone. That way they could spend, and the article went on to say that sometimes they chose as a family to watch a movie together, or, or, or whatever it may be. It may involve screen time, but it was something that they could do together instead of everybody out on their own. Folks, maybe today we need to establish some, some guidelines in our household. Number five, avoid mindless gaming and scroll, scroll, scrolling. Avoid those mindless. It's easy to turn mindless things in our device. And, and here's our excuse. It helps me relax. It keeps me from being distracted. Helps me wind down. Or sometimes we just say it's fun. But it's proven time after time that that mindless scrolling or mindless gaming is actually very unhealthy to us. And one of the things that they found, and I guarantee you when I tell you this, all of a sudden that light bulb's going to come on because you know somebody. The child that uses screen time or video games to unwind will still be doing the same thing when they're 30 and have a family. I can tell you a personal story here. I was called by a family to come to their house. They, they, they were struggling. There, there was a, a huge problem. Now, this family didn't go to our church. Matter of fact, I don't know that this family went to church anywhere. So, so you can imagine the type of problem that, that a family is going to, an unchurched family is going to call a pastor to come to their house to talk about. This is huge. When I got to the house, the, the, the lady of the house was there. I think one, an older child was there. A, a couple grandparents was there. But you know where the man of the house was? He was in another room with a headset on, yelling at a, a, a gaming system. And, and I said, well, what, what's he doing? I called him my name. I knew him. I said, what, what, what's he doing? And his wife says, oh... I told him he could just go ahead and play his game. It's how he winds down after work. I begin to think, and you need me to tell you what the problem is? What they found is that child who uses screen times and video games to unwind, when he's 30 and has a family, he's still going to need to do the same thing. Put down the device. Go outside. Do something that engages your senses. But avoid mindless gaming and scrolling. Number six. Train yourself not to respond immediately. Do you really need to respond immediately to that message? Or that alert? It, 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 does it always need an immediate response? I've been standing face to face with folks having a conversation and their phone buzzes and the next thing I know they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of paying attention to me, but do we really need to do that? We need to realize something. Our devices are training us. Our devices are training us, and we're to that place where, where you know, when all of a sudden the device, we, we got to look. And we're, we've got to the place in our lives, we can't help it. We don't even realize we're doing it, Buzz. We're pulling up, and that makes it even easier. I mean, now we, we, we have it on our wrists. Bzz. I watched a person in church one time, I thought, they can't wait for this thing to be over with. Because like every 30 seconds, they were checking the time. I didn't know what a smartwatch was at that time. I didn't realize they were responding to messages and, and, and seeing what everybody else was saying. and They weren't paying attention to me. 
what is happening is when we reflectively look at that message or look at that alert, it's taking our attention away from what's happening around us. Let me ask you a question, just between you and me. Do we really need our phones in church? I mean, let's stop and think about it. And I know somebody's going to say, well, Pastor Dan, I have my Bible on my phone. Well, if that's your only reason to have your phone in church, then on your way out the door, on the table on this side, there's a stack of, of God's Word Bibles. Grab yourself one. That, I mean, really, I, I'll take away that one. Let me, ask, let me ask another question, just for the fun of it. H how many of you... You don't raise your hand, but how many of you are aware that I'm just checking? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you will figure it out later. Some of you may never know. But you probably should have got a text from me during the sermon. And all it said was just checking. Because I wanted to see how many of you already knew now maybe you didn't because I put Luke in charge of sin in it so <laughs> all right you should have got it but but here's the thing we have conditioned ourselves that no matter where we are no matter what we're doing no matter if we're in the middle of a worship service bzz, we have to know so we've trained ourselves, or our device has trained us to do that. So now we have to reverse that. We have to train ourselves not to respond immediately. Because we've already been trained one way. So it's going to help. We've got to reverse that. And then number seven, I think it's word seven. Establish digital free zones. I think one of the things that we could do in our family is establish those sacred places where device are not, devices, devices are not allowed. In, in, in your household, this may be it. or that, And it may be different places for each household. Maybe you'll say, in our family, when we're in the car together, no electronic devices. That way, we can listen to music, or we can talk, or we can sing, or, or we can do whatever. Some of your parents are going, oh, no, not that one, Pastor Dan. My kids would drive me nuts when I was driving. If I need them, I'll send them a text. Maybe for you, it's at the dinner table. Let me, let me, can I just give you a Pastor Dan challenge? Every time you go out to eat, leave your device in the car. Holly and I met for breakfast. Now, that sounds really bad. Holly and I met for breakfast. We had went different ways, and we, we came together for breakfast yesterday morning. So knowing what, what I, I kind of took a survey, and right around 50% of the people in that restaurant was on their phones during their meal. One, port, one table had five people sitting at it, and they, they, they couldn't even eat because they were all on their devices. I think they were probably talking to each other, but I don't know that. Establish digital free zones. And one of those digital free zones should be when you're around other people, put the electronic device away. Just, just make that. These kind of limits allow for more attention. Allow for a better connection. Did you realize that one of the things that's happening today in our digital world, more and more folks are lonely. Why? Because nobody communicates. And loneliness has taken over. I don't know about you, but I love technology. <laughs> I really do. Technology allows me to connect with my family no matter where we are. I, I, can, I can connect with my family even if we're in different places. I love that. I, I love technology. Because somewhere out there, somebody's watching this sermon this morning because of technology. I, I love it. I love the fact that technology allows me to research things that I don't know. 
Some of y'all remember, we were on a mission trip, and we were in the middle of a construction project, and it got to the place where none of us knew what to do next. So I went and got my laptop, connected to the internet, watched it. We all stood around, six of us, watching a YouTube video. Then we went back to work and finished the project. I love being able to do that. Technology is great as long as it's serving us. But folks, when we begin to serve it, it's become our master. And unfortunately, today in our families, many of our households have a new master. But God says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So here's my challenge today. I challenge you to ask God. Is technology serving you, or are you serving technology? And if God lets you know that you have a new master, it's time to seek forgiveness. It's time to fight for your family. It may be that today some of your children are going to be really mad. Some of your teenagers are going to develop quite an attitude. Because maybe today there's going to be some new rules at your house. But I have a question. I know I've asked a lot of questions today. But here's my simple question. Is your family worth it? Is your family worth the change? I've called this series Fighting for the Family. And friends, I want you to know, this may be your biggest fight. But you have to decide. You have to decide. And it's going to start with us. Is technology serving me? Or am I serving technology? And maybe today, you're finding that you are addicted to that device. Whatever that device may be. I mean, it could be your, your TV. It could be your, your phone. It could be your tablet. It could be your Xbox. It could be your PlayStation. I mean, and it could go on. But, but you're finding, I'm addicted. And just like an addict, I think I can control it. But really, you can't. So maybe today it's going to start with you going, God, I'm, a, I'm an addict. And I need you to help to deliver me from this addiction. Maybe for you today, it's realizing that I'm not doing my family any favors with my screen time. So maybe your commitment to God today is going to be, God, I've got to give some of this up. Because my family is that important. Maybe... It's a parenting issue. My kids deserve more. More of me. They deserve to learn to communicate. To listen. To make eye contact. So God forgive me for not teaching my children the way they should go. It started a long time ago folks. But it can end today. What is God speaking to you? What what is he saying into your life? What needs to change? Are you willing to go against the number one enemy of your household? And put on the armor of God and fight for your family. Maybe as I pray, you just need to say, God, I'm going to fight. Or maybe as our praise team comes to to lead in this next song, you want to come and and, and just lay it right there before God at the altar. God, I'm fighting for my family. And I know it's not going to be pleasant and they're not going to like it, but I'm fighting for my family. 
But there's an enemy in our house. And we've invited it in. And the enemy, there's really nothing wrong with it as long as it serves us. But when we're serving it, that's the problem. What do you need to do this morning? Father God, I want to just pray specifically for every person here, including me. We've not only allowed this enemy to get a foothold, but we've let it take over. And we've made it a God. So God, I know it's up to each one of us to make that decision, but God, I pray for your forgiveness. And I pray for every person here that they'll pray for your forgiveness too if they've made it their God. Help us, Lord, to have no other gods before us. Guide us to making you our one and only. Lead us, Lord, to fight for our families. And my prayer is that we each say yes, Lord. And fight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just stand with us, please, as we sing Great One You Are.